All right. All right. Now for the bonus question, which is by far the Real most important question. part of this. Oh no! A question I might add submitted by Matt. How do you know that? I definitely know. I know absolutely that it was submitted by you. Uh, do you want to read the question? You're the you're the host. The question I'm quoting is. What is the best sport and why is it hockey? It's a rhetorical question. It's the best sport. It's, it's so much no. fun. It's fast. It's the ultimate team game. It's, uh, it's No, I thought we agreed Space Alert was the ultimate team game. Um, uh, team game. It's the ultimate team sport. I, I put my vote in for golf. It's not fast and it's... it contains almost always no teams. Very questionably a sport. It's a sport. Mm. Is archery a sport? Mm. You have a very strict definition of sport. Yeah. Uh. All right. So just if we stay at the uh, what is the best sport half of the question. Uh, for me, de- the favorite sport live is definitely hockey. Uh, easily that's the best sport to go to. I think so it's golf. Life, no. <laughs> No, no, no. Going to watch golf? That has to be the worst sport possible. Have you ever watched golf live? No. Oh, I've done it probably half a dozen times. It's actually really fun. Maybe that's why you are like you are. It's one of the reasons I am like I am. (laughs) All right, we'll just leave that there. Um, For me, the favorite one to follow is football. I like watching it uh, at home. Fantasy football is fun. And because of fantasy football, uh, that's a lot of fun. Uh, The... Biggest difference from the regular season to the postseason is probably basketball. I think I care Ooh. about hockey a little bit more. I would say baseball. Say. Hockey is a huge difference. Too. Yeah, there those, is those nothing two are the as exciting in sports as playoff hockey. Playoff hockey is fun, but I think the biggest jump is in baseball. Because actual like strategy and the way you think about games and the way you think about managing it completely changes when you hit the the playoffs. Because yeah. you all of a sudden you start thinking really short term, mm-hmm. whereas during the regular season you're managing very long term. Yeah, and it makes some interesting situations. Yeah, well, and it also changes how teams think during like the latter half of the season when they all of a sudden the teams in playoff contention start actually preparing to create a roster that is better suited for the playoffs where like relief pitchers are much more important. So going back to hockey, then the second part of this question, Matt and I have been going back and forth and talking about hockey analytics recently. And the most interesting question was brought up uh, kind of as a challenge this week as by one of our uh, our favorite hockey analytics, Twitter accounts, ineffective math, ineffective math. And uh, so he has the sour candy hockey prediction challenge. And basically, you send in the predicted score total at the end of the season. Points total. Points total. Points total for each team. And a confidence interval or standard deviation, yeah. basically. And so based on how accurate you are and how large of a standard deviation, you accumulate points based on the bell curve formula. And then the person who has the most statistical points uh, as a, you know, will be mailed a disturbingly large amount of sour candy of their choice. Yeah. Wow. Now that's a reward. I know, right? This is something I can get excited about. Are you guys, you guys going to do it? Yeah, I'm getting all like tense about it because I... You really matters. want some sour candy. It matters. Sour candy is important. Yeah. So my first thought was... Well, okay. So it's just like to step back and lay ground rules. The uh, If you put a, a... If you nail the... Uh, the the points total, and you give a confidence interval of zero. That is worth one one point. One point yeah, because that's sure. that's the max. And there are thirty one teams, so max of thirty one points. Now he said the the winner last year had about one point two five points total. Total. Okay, that was the winning score. That seems pretty low. I think it was one point nine five, wasn't it? I thought it was one two five. It was. I could be I wrong. It was under two. Anyways, but, yeah. So huh. my first thought was, what if you just took the team's uh, point total from last year and added like a plus minus 10 points because a win is worth two and a, 
over time loss is worth one. Okay. So a game is worth zero to two points. So is it set up so that I, if their actual total falls outside of the confidence interval, you get nothing. you get nothing. No, 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 no. No, it, it's a normal distribution. So your score for that team is is the probability of drawing that point total from the normal distribution. I think rounded to a tenth of a percent. Oh, so you don't give the probability. You give the mean and you give the standard deviation. So if you give... I see. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. On a normal distribution. Yep. Okay. Yeah. That's interesting. So the maximum score per team is one. Yeah. Um, but you don't have to put all of your uh, eggs in one number basket. You can sure. spread it over a normal distribution of your size. Sorry. A normal distri- distribution of your size choice. of your choice. Yes. So I, I went out and my first kind of initial thought was, what if we just take their point total from last year, add plus minus 10 as a standard deviation. And I graphed that out and I figure on average I end up with about 0.975, which is definitely not a winning score. Okay. So we got to do better, and the way you got to decrease the standard deviation because it uh, that's a that's a squared term, so that gets that it makes the numbers a lot smaller. So, uh, and this is where I'm at now is my conundrum of how do I approach this problem, um, and so the things I want to look at are kind of the historical changes of team's points over the last couple of years and uh what what, else, what were the other things we were talking about of including so in a, in a two-tailed uh normal distribution one standard deviation is like what 68 percent 67 67 something like two standard deviations is like 93 i think I thought it was like 94.5. Yes, yes, but you're you're thinking of the area, like how much of the area falls in a range. Right. I think it I think it boils down to if you if you put one standard deviation and you you get it right on, it's worth 0.4. So 40%. If you're one off, it's worth 0.2. Okay. Um Oh, and, and I, guess, I see. I and see. And I guess summing that up, but I mean, wouldn't you want to line up your standard deviation with, like, you'd want to you'd you'd want to create a confidence measure at some point, and then just align it with that to be the most yes. accurate. The key though is yes. is trying to tighten up your confidence. Yes. Through yeah. analytics, yeah. But the other thing is, I just want the candy, so I would. Well, ra- I'm trying to. I would rather. See, this is it's a go it's a go big or go home scenario, right? That's true. That's it's also problem. a game so, in which so there's only going to be I'm, one winner. I'm considering, yes. Yeah. So I'm considering just putting zero confidence intervals on everything, doing the best I can to get within a range, and hoping you hit two of them. If I get lucky on three of them, which is in the realm of possibilities, then I have a score well above last year's winner. That's probably the way to go in this. I'm having a hard time convincing myself otherwise. That seems like the way to go. I think you the, the, the go... question is how predictable. Like, what are the the reasonable ranges? Even, right. Like, even when you're really confident about where a team's going to end up in the standings, you know, what's the range of points? Ah. I looked at some the size of different uh, bell curves, and I think going up to about a you could go up to a confidence of two without losing too much. Maybe three. Okay. Okay. Because it is squared, you know, so going from two to three is not that much, but then three to four, it, 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 it you know, it's exponential sure. growth. So yeah. I think, again, taking into account that a game is worth zero to two points and two seems to be, I think you could win with like seven to ten correct answer, answers with a two. Uh, two on either side. Two on either side. Yeah. Uh, that intuitively that feels about right i don't know what where the sweet spot the uh, of um how tight you can get your confidence intervals and still have a high chance of getting it right what's the scale we're looking like here like a top hockey 
team will have like what 110 points yeah 110 okay yeah so probably teams um, finish from like 60 to 110 so that's a fairly sh- 50 point range hockey and you could is, probably pretty easily closer... figure out the you know which 10 point range they'll fit in right right yeah yeah Hockey's a lot closer to baseball on in the spectrum of um, like win percentages. Right. Yeah. So everyone is usually between like point four and point six, or point six five or something. It'd be yeah. super interesting to chart this out, but I think the more highly variable play is the way to go if you want to try to win. I think you're right there because I mean we talked about this before in any kind of game. I'm not trying to be predictive. I'm trying to get... You're trying to get the candy. ...disturbing amount of (laughs) sour candy. Well, we talked about this before. When you have a very low chance of winning, you have to take highly variable actions. Yeah. Right. And so looking at it, I can take kind of the safe play of pick their last year's total and give a large confidence interval, and I'm pretty likely to get most or all of them correct within that bucket. But the and so I have a high floor of my score. Right, I have a low ceiling because right. yeah, even you're going to be somewhere exactly, in in the middle of the bell curve. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So you have to for this sort of thing. If you want to, you know, be the top score, you have to take the more variable variance plays. Yeah. And rely on that variance to get up there. That's super interesting. Hockey analytics. Mark is interested. Look at that. Well, this isn't analytics. This is a. <laughs> This is a game. <laughs> but analytics is just... Using no, analytics is super fun. Hockey's yeah. got to be one of the hardest ones to do, though. It is. Oh, it's so exciting. Um, well, I mean, just the... like figuring out the margin. Because players only play a quarter of the game, basically, each. On average. Yeah. Uh, forwards are a quarter, defenders a third. Um, and it's, I mean, it's even... So the difference in, like, win probability to added has, has yeah. to be really sh- tiny between even, like, the best and the worst player on a team. It's even interesting to chart uh, player usage. Um, like, some teams have very flat distributions. Some have a lot steeper. And it comes at a cost. You can have your best player on the ice for 22 minutes. Mm-hmm. Um, but what's the diminishing returns, I guess? Yeah. Yeah. Um, are you going to wear them out over time? And the other thing is the, there's not as much stats collected in hockey. It's a fluid sport compared to something like baseball yeah. where there's, you can literally count everything in the sport. Right. Like, well, baseball, like baseball has trouble on defense, but yeah. Okay. Sure. Right. But basically hockey's just that yeah. for the whole game. It's baseball defense. You know, it's really fluid in dealing with like yeah. distances you can't precisely measure and, and even with hockey you're constantly you're subbing on and on off lines. On play, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um interesting baseball has historical issues to deal with, like pitcher wins, which aren't that predictive. No, that's a horrible stat. It's, it's a horrible stat. The second assist, you know, or how, what? Do, how do you value assist in ho- oh, hockey? It's got to be a nightmare. It's a nightmare. It really is. Um, figuring out what's predictive or not is what makes, um, I don't know, hockey analytics people on Twitter really interesting. <laughs> yeah. I mean, in baseball, you have really elegant, you know, like uh, on-base percentage, on-base plus slugging. Yeah. And on the pitcher side, whip are both really elegant ways. That's walks and hits, walks plus hits per innings pitched. So they just deal with the idea of base runners are good if you're the offense and bad if you're the defense, which is predictive and makes sense in a very fundamental, elegant way. Yeah. And those are, yeah. those are real. I really enjoy is, statistics isn't like that. Is war really big in baseball? Yeah, war. Well, it's, it's the, it's the most popular way to sum up a player into one okay. single number, gotcha. but that means it necessarily has to include defense, which is okay. where baseball, gotcha. yeah. it's it's very different. You can have, there's like the fan graphs and the, I forget the other main, the other main site that does stats, but they'll, they'll often have very different results on defense. And there are a lot of different ways you can measure it. You can measure range and, you know, yeah. the, the traditional way is just, talking about errors but that doesn't factor in the fact that you know a better shortstop who has more range is going to 
maybe have more errors just because he's getting Kids close there. to plays that other shortstops would not get close to. Uh, so it's it's very tricky. So war is the biggest one. Even if he doesn't one. have errors, he'll make more plays than another shortstop. He'll he'll be more active, yeah. Which isn't count, captured by counting the number of errors. Well, and the weird thing is that more, a bit more, I think, a bit more helpful than like fielding percentage. So the percentage of uh, attempts you make that don't result in an error is just pure counting stats of the number of uh, putouts you, you make or the assists you make, depending on the position, I think is actually a bit more valuable than the percentage one, which is weird to think about. Huh. I mean, it, you know, after you factor in innings played or whatever. I don't know. I love baseball I, stats. It's I learned something so interesting. really cool since we're doing a deep dive into analytics. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll put this out as a bonus the, podcast. Um, in hockey, there's a thing called PDO, which actually doesn't stand for anything. Um, (laughs) But basically, it's the sum, or the difference, I forget, of um, your team's save percentage minus the opponent's team's save percentage while you're on the ice. And you can do it for just for the team total, or you can do it it for an individual player when they're on the ice. Um, And this is the cool thing. It's useful because it's not predictive. So what it does is it it gives you a really sort of accurate measure of how lucky you've been. So, oh, yeah. Um, I the, think... the baseball equivalent is uh, uh, BABIP, batting average on balls in play. Okay. Uh, so if you find like a really, a really, you know, a baseball player that's like ex- exceeding expectations... Uh, yeah. batting average on balls in play is on average a hair over 300. So if you see they're doing like 340, that means they're most likely going to regress down to the mean. Yeah. Um, cause that's just a matter of how lucky they get at hitting holes in the, in the defense. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Could proceed. Yeah. yeah. Is it, were you done? <laughs> uh, yeah, basically I just found that exceedingly interesting. I, I think that that might've been ineffective math. I should say a regurgitate regurgitating things I hear from really interesting people on Twitter. I think Don Lewis Chicken, that's not how you pronounce his name, but that's how I pronounce his name. <laughs> um, might have might have put that in, in an article recently. Um, so sh- shout outs, our two favorites are Ineffective Math and na- Dom. Stat Trick? Or he- what's that? Natural Stat Trick or something? Um, that's one too. That's not Dom. Okay, and Dom. And Dom. I don't know. That he's one. on the. I think he's on the. Like, if you type in Dom on Twitter, he's on the the first page of results. <laughs> also, shout out uh, in football analytics to Pete Ratings. Oh yeah, which is a guy yeah. new from I know from high school in the debate world, who's now an economist but does football analytics. So that's P E T E Ratings. I think dot wordpress dot com, yeah. and he does really good. It's been stuff. really interesting to follow. He does really good stuff in football analytics. Yeah, his site has actually inspired me to want to work on this sort of project, yeah. my own analytics yeah. platform. One thing I'm enjoying in, in, Which ho- I haven't gotten to yet. in hockey and analytics is there are all these really interesting people on Twitter um, who are coming up with these models. like mm-hmm. Because, we first of all, hockey doesn't have the data out there. And people haven't figured out what's predictive. Yeah. So there are all these tough. different approaches to building models. How? Uh, really. Let me ask you, how is uh, plus minus viewed? Is that? Very negatively. Very negative. Yeah. That's what I would assume. Yeah. And um, part of it's just like, it's difficult because it's weird. There are just situations that you can't account for in a clean way. Like, what do you do with power plays? Oh, play, yeah. Uh, so I think generally what happens is um, you don't get credit when you're on the power play, but hmm. it, I it's it's just there's no clean way of, of of doing it. I wonder if it's a bit better in basketball than it is in hockey. Probably uh, that well, that would be my guess. There's not, I mean, you never take a person off the court in basketball, so there's never a five on four <laughs> yeah. situation. And also, yeah, and there's a lot more. There's a lot more, there are a lot more units of scoring. Yeah. Yes, yeah. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah, like you can always you can find really interesting outliers in plus minus. Yeah. And like the best players in the league don't necessarily have great plus minuses. Well, and also because you're, in hockey you're rotating benches, the best players are, I assume, frequently up against their opponent's best players. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Which it, can skew it, and too. that's another incredibly interesting thing because you have three lines of defenders and four lines of forwards. Usually you have a shutdown line. Your best defenders, who you're trying to match up against the other team's best forwards, that that's, gonna, that's going to mitigate the value on paper of both units, right? Yeah, yeah. They're going to cancel each out, yeah. each other out. Um, and, the, and there are interesting ways of trying to figure out how to measure that. Right. Um, uh, yeah, hockey's got to be the hardest one. Yeah. Like, it's similar to soccer, but I feel like there's a lot more you can do with soccer. And I, lo- I know there's a lot more that is done with one, soccer. One of the things that I think is unique about hockey that's really cool is, though it's fluid, with the constant changes... Um, you do have all these different combinations of people on the ice at once. Yeah. Um, which I don't know. Yeah, I mean that by itself in soccer, you it's the opposite. You can barely do any substitutions. <laughs> exactly. The one, well, I mean, the super ambitious approach to this that I would like to take is actually build a machine vision system to watch the games and then count like pass percentages yeah. between certain players or something because i yeah. don't think that's captured in the box score anywhere uh i've seen yeah. like all... that, that's totally where sports analytics is gonna go i think that it's close in soccer um and they, I, they use it in basketball too so do they they're, they're okay yeah. they're improving that yeah um they talk about tracking stats in hockey mm-hmm. well i know in soccer i saw this thing a couple years ago you know actually a long time i've been in high school where in in Europe at least they have entire squads. It was interviewing this this organization that just has a room full of like fifty people at giant monitors, and they chart, they track the exact distance of like every yeah. single pass. Like they're they're like manually recording the movement of like every single player on the field, yeah. and apparently they do absurd analytic stuff with all of this data that they mine it's it's exciting i mean and just my mind goes to like if we can track the movements of players you know and if you can look at every say every goal that happens um maybe you can say every power play goal can you somehow look at the movements of players and use some machine learning kind of thing to draw out like what are the predictive what are the successful patterns or something? What are the patterns? Can we, can we find? Yeah. I, the idea of that is super cool and interesting. I can't imagine we're anywhere close to doing that. Yeah, that's that's got to be so difficult. And, and from like a games perspective, there's a bunch of little mini games going on here with the different interests. Because you have the analytics people who are trying to find something that yeah. will help like betting you know people betting on the game or people playing fantasy hockey or whatever yeah um but also find you know getting all of this information all of this data that they can maybe sell to teams but then as yeah. like a manager like you have the whole meta game of like managing your roster and keeping people healthy um and trying to to build toward a playoff team or a team that's going to be successful in the playoffs and then you have you know, interpersonal managerial things that are maybe or maybe not informed by the analytics. And you have the question of, you know, how do you coach someone when you know players certain can, things that they don't want to hear about advanced stats? Yeah. So, as like a manager or a coach, you then have to take this information, if it is indeed valuable, and then translate it into your coaching to try to help the players and then try to have it maybe affect your management. Uh, of the of the game itself so you have all these different incentives and different games lined up along all the different players within the whole organizational structure of of hockey teams and then these analysts it's it's super interesting what's the um what's the state of sabermetrics in baseball right now i don't know it's strong it's been strong since you know the 90s (laughs) but there's still people that just like Discounted on principle, right? 
Well, yeah, it, it's so frustrating to watch baseball games and then listen to the you know announcers being all gruff and old school. And slowly, slowly, you've heard over the years, you know, they'll start using war maybe or talk about the swinging, uh, swinging strike percentages or something like that. Uh, the big thing that the the producers of these broadcasts are pushing is all of the new technology in in calculating the reaction of the ball off the bat so they can now oh, yeah. launch percentage is now a big I, thing. I saw like a splatter graph of um, contact versus um, hit percentage. At all the different angles, yeah, coming off a of bat. That's the new thing coming out of this year is this launch angle because they now okay. can calc. They'll now have things well, that can calculate all that right? and, and exit velocity. Five thirty eight, which does great sports stuff. Yeah, uh, had an article with um, like a shift in, in. What do they say? Batters used to be taught to swing down, level. Le- okay, level. Yeah. Okay. Well, well, well there, there's... okay, a bit of baseball history. Way back in, like, 1910, they were taught to, like, literally chop down on the ball because the ground was so bad Yeah, that they'd, like, or sometimes, like, really hard, so they'd chop down and it'd bounce and go really high and they'd be fast enough to run and get a single off of it. But that's, like, you know, Ty Cobb used to do that. That hasn't been relevant for years. Yeah. And then always the, you know, the the... The common line of thinking was to swing really level because the idea is to maximize the the amount of time the bat is basically on the plane with the ball. Oh, fascinating! Fascinating with the ball. Yeah. Okay. But now swings are becoming more uppercut because of this launch angle thing. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think I think one of the takeaways from that five thirty eight piece is there are younger batters who are batting way better after starting an uppercut. Um, and it, it's kind of, ch- I don't know. It's interesting. It's also it's also increased the strikeout percentage and swinging strike percentage. So they are batting oftentimes better from some statistical standpoints, but batting averages, I think, have dipped a hair. Um, and strikeout rates have increased a lot. You know, like people are, you know, Mark Reynolds broke the strikeout record a few years ago. And, you know, it's it's pretty common, you know, relatively common for someone to get more than 200 strikeouts in a season where, you know, that, you know, 30, 40 years ago, that would be absolutely unheard of. You know, if you had more than 100 strikeouts because because they were just swinging for contact a lot. Yeah. And it was all about batting average. And so, you you know, to get a good batting average, you want to touch the ball a lot but now we have more advanced statistical measures and we understand the value of different types of hits so the value of you know going for a a more powerful swing where you're maybe going to get a double but you do it slightly less often is maybe more than if you got a lot of singles so i think that's what's driving it so fascinating and at least this year uh, home run rates have skyrocketed baseball's probably at least last time I checked, is going to shatter the home run rate record. Wow. For yeah, a whole some season. Some guy in the National League, I think, broke uh, not the record, but the the 62 home run. or the Yeah, Giancarlo run. Stanton, who's yeah. always been, ever since they've had this exit velocity thing, he's always been like, you know, he's like, he's like the top 30. He's just stupidly strong. Um, and then Aaron Judge broke the rookie record. Uh, he broke Mark McGuire's rookie home run record. I think he hit his 52nd the other wow. day. Okay. Uh, but just overall, there are so many more guys now who are hitting like 15 to 25 home runs, it seems. Um, whereas before, they'd hit like 5 to 10 or something like that. I mean, last time I checked, there was like a 40% home run increase from last year. Wow. Which is just insane. So there's a lot of conspiracy that maybe they changed the balls a bit. Um, because in the excluding this year, the past three, four, five years have been really pitcher friendly. Hmm. Like uh, scoring rates went down and, and ERAs went down. Uh, and then all of a sudden this year, the scoring rate hasn't, if I remember correctly, the scoring rate hasn't gone up that much. 
just home runs. And I think it's this new swinging strategy of, of hitting, you know, swinging more of an uppercut. It's really fascinating to watch. A large part of me just wants to quantify everything and like, What's baseball's your game yeah, then? Right, yeah. Um, although we get into the frustration of why can't we have robot umpires if we can quantify everything? <laughs> but, I'm uh, I'm leaning more towards your side on that debate now after watching a lot of baseball this season. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're they're just showing it on every play. So I think the broadcasters. Yeah, I would not be surprised if Major League Baseball and the broad and the networks that are broadcasting baseball are in a long-term strategy to get people acquainted with that technology to take away home yeah. plate umpires. Yeah. Cause like every channel that I've seen is showing it on almost every pitch. Yeah. I mean, this was like five years ago. And also but, but... commentators are now outright saying, Oh, that was a bad call. Yeah. Whereas it, was, it used to be funny back when they started this pitch tracking thing. The, you'd notice the commenters would never say anything bad about the ref's call. Yeah. They'd just kind of ignore it. And you see a little bit of that now. Yeah. But I'm seeing much more where they're like, oh, yeah, you know, he got lucky on that one. <laughs> or comments like that, yeah. which is I mean, fascinating. Don't get me wrong. There are lots of things in sports that will always be judgment calls. But baseball, everything is so well defined. Relative to other problems in sports, I think. It's just, yeah. Like, you're showing it on the television. You've already, you already have the technology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, I enjoy baseball. Yeah. It's good. Although, sadly, the Cardinals have missed the playoffs. Yeah, I saw the end of the game the other day. And I almost tweeted at you, looks like a miracle did not happen. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> they're going to finish with a positive record, but you know, they're still in rebuilding. You know, the last few years they kind of been. But on the plus side, uh, we got a lot of younger players who really emerged this season. We have uh, Tommy Pham, who is this season is the best player on the team. He's finished. He's going to finish close to six war, which is impressive. Um, and then Paul DeYoung, who is a home run hitting shortstop, who's pretty good. Wins above a replacement. So in baseball, you interpret WAR as uh, with this player on the field against a replacement level player, yeah. your team will win that many more games. Yes. Um, cool. Yeah. There's a well, Dom I mentioned earlier has a he calls it gar i'm not sure what the difference games i have no idea oh i think he has this thing called game score i think it translates loosely into to wins above replacement. yeah yeah but i find it interesting i think the best players in the nhl are around three okay gar um in an 82 game season so i guess that roughly six war in baseball comparison six so what are the best players in baseball um Six war would be firmly all star level. Okay. Um, the MVP on an average year would be if they're or rather the best, like top three players on a typical year would be around eight to okay. nine. Okay. Like the best season, like Babe Ruth's best season is like fourteen. Yeah, that's what I would expect. I would expect to be a bit higher in baseball. Yeah, yeah. And then I, would, I don't know. Yeah, so you'll see the top players between, like, 6 and 9. Well, speaking of baseball record, my hometown Mariners have clinched a losing season, which uh, extends their streak of not having consecutive winning seasons back to 2003. Wow. Oh, please. You're talking the Pittsburgh <laughs> fan. Not having consecutive winning seasons. How about Man, that? when's How? the last time the Cardinals had a losing season? Okay, but the Mariners also haven't been in the playoffs since 2003. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's 2003 Pirate. is only two years after they broke the record for wins. <laughs> yeah. Wow. 2001, <laughs> they set the record, 116 wins. 2002, 2003, they, had, they went 93 and 69. And then the next year, they won 63 games. Wow. And haven't had consecutive winning seasons since then. I think I counted the other day and... Before this season, they were like, they had like nine losing seasons and six winning seasons over the last 15 years or something. No playoffs. 
and it's it's just all the Seattle sports people that I follow because I'm still kind of I enjoy Seattle sports. They all like get excited about the Mariners, and I'm just I'm never going to be excited until they, you know, prove that they're not a below average team. <laughs> So the last time the Cardinals had a losing record was 2007. The time before that was 1999. So you've had two losing seasons in In the last 20 years? 18 years, yeah. Or uh, three in the last 20 years. I think the Pirates went from 91 to 2014? That sounds about right. No, it was during college, wasn't it? Without a winning season? Towards the end of college. 2012 or 2013, I thought. 12 or 13. Okay. okay. I yeah. thought. Yeah. So, like, roughly 23 years, 22, 23 years. Oh, Tommy Pham has hit exactly six war on baseball reference. Nice. Sweet. That's fun. It shows the best players each year. We have a streak of one, two, th- oh, no, oh, there's, except for, except for 2004, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine seasons where Albert Pujols was our best player. Oh, I love Pujols. He's the best. That was a long digression on sports analytics. Well, yeah. tangents all the way down. Tangents all the way the down. Subtitle of the well, I think this is, this is a tangent so big, I think I'll just throw it out as a bonus podcast. <laughs> yeah. That was fun, though. 